Good evening, fellow entrepreneurs, small business owners, and side hustlers. I'm Tomoza Fletuayo, and welcome once again to an awesome episode of the Business Forecast. That's right, it's the Entrepreneur's Podcast. It's the show that gets you connected to a wide array of specialists, successful entrepreneurs, and successful business leaders who are all here for one thing and one thing only, and that is to help you take your business to the next level by connecting you to the right information as well as the right opportunities for your business. Over the past few weeks, you I mean, past few months even, we've had awesome, awesome guests coming through and giving what I believe is some of the best content when it comes to small businesses in South Africa. And this is why we're here. We're just here to constantly give you value for your businesses so that you have practical tools you can apply to your business to help you get to the next level. And to help us with this, we always invite some of the best business professionals in the country. And these are the people that you want to learn from. And we make sure that we bring them straight to you. And today, of course, we have another exciting episode and another incredible guest who has agreed to honor us with her presence on this show. Today, we have a topic that I'm sure a lot of us will want to hear about, you know, and that is unmasking SME funding in South Africa or SME funding in South Africa unmasked. We all know that we need funding to start our businesses and we all know that it's so hard to get funding in South Africa. But there's so many things that I feel like we need to know about and need to learn about. And that's what today's show is about. And of course, we've got one of the best people on this topic in the country that you can hear from. I'm talking, of course, about Ms. Zizipo Nyanga. Ms. Zizipo Nyanga is one of the foremost experts, I believe, when it comes to SME development and SME funding in the country. She currently is a managing executive at Grinrod Bank for SME and platform banking. She's also a chartered accountant. She's an acclaimed speaker. And she also has her own podcast. Imagine she also has her own podcast show. And, you know, you can go on there to learn so much about leadership. And she gives the one of, some of the best content that is available out there when you want to grow either as a professional or as a business. And she has agreed to come through and talk to us about this topic. Like, you have to understand, Ms. Nyanga has, been, has worked for some of the best financial institutions in the country, specifically focused on SMEs and entrepreneurs. So we're about to hear, you know, from somebody who's really, really great at this topic. So without any further ado, please help me to welcome to the studio, Umiz Ziziponyanga. Ms. Nyanga, good evening and welcome to our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ntokoza. That was a, a nervous laugh or a happy laugh. I don't know what laugh it was. I really love to laugh and uh, I'm always amazed when I hear people introducing me. Thank you very much for having me and hello oh, to, the, to everyone who's listening. Oh, no, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you. And we just want to say thank you, firstly, for joining us. I feel like I didn't even do justice when it comes to what I could have spoken about you. There's so much to say and there's so much value that we can derive from you. And we're just honored, you know, for this honor and opportunity to, to engage with you the way uh, we are about to today. And before we get any further, maybe we can start this off by getting to know you a bit. You know, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself and how you ended up at this place where you're passionate about entrepreneurship and SMEs and leadership development in our country. So my name is Zizipo. I was born in Kuala. I'm married, uh, hence uh, the surname Nyanga. I'm a mother of two boys uh, and I'm a sister, I'm a wife. Before I become a chartered accountant, I'm a human being and I think it's important for us to remember that and for entrepreneurs, before you are an entrepreneur and you are running around, you know, looking for funding or running your business, you are a human being um, uh, before then. So I'm very passionate about personal growth. I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm passionate about creating rather than just consuming. So the, the fact that I became a chartered accountant was uh, not by accident. Uh, I think my parents so it fit to push me towards that direction because at a very young age, I was selling sweets, I was selling ice lollies, I was selling anything I could find. And I wasn't ashamed to talk about money. Uh, and I grew up in a family where my mother was a teacher and my father was in agriculture. So uh, meetings about education and about putting food on the table, about business um, 
aspirations was uh, normal for me. So I, I think that I became a chartered accountant because of that. And I thank God that my parents nurtured that um, uh, 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 passion at a very young age. And uh, as I uh, navigated through my studies and career, I then found myself uh, in the space where I'm helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses. Wow. Sure, that, that is quite awesome. And I, I love what you're saying. And, and it's, it's, it's new and it's refreshing, you know, that before we're anything else, we're human beings and it's good to get to, you know, know who you are so that that drives a sort of feel. And to have parents who saw your talent and, and encouraged you in that direction was absolutely awesome, I think. And we're thankful because if it wasn't for that, you, we probably wouldn't be hearing from you and you probably wouldn't have helped as many small businesses. I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos and I know I'm not going to mention some of the other companies, but that you've worked for and how much you've helped so many SMEs. It's really, really um, inspiring and it's awesome. And I always want to say, you know, thank you um, thank for your you. service to, to the small business sector. But as we get into this topic, which I know you're so knowledgeable in, which is the topic of funding, maybe we can start with, you know, the first question that we have for today. And that is, what are some of the various um, funding avenues that are available for SMEs or entrepreneurs in South Africa? So there's a lot of uh, funding avenues available. I think I would like to start with the fact that entrepreneurs and businesses in, in the SME space need to know where are they in their growth phase. There are people that are in the survivalist you know, stage. There are people that are uh, in the small, medium uh, enterprise and they are growing their businesses. And there are people that are in the mature stage of entrepreneurship. So once you identify where exactly you are on that growth uh, phase, you can then be able to determine what type of funding is suitable for you. Because I'm sure you will agree with me, Ndogozo, that not every business can handle debt. Mm. Not every entrepreneur would like to have a shareholder come on board. Not everyone uh, knows what's available out there. So there, there's grant funding that's available for uh, especially those smaller enterprises that are at an infancy stage. They're surviving. They're still trying to test an idea. And then there's um, development finance uh, uh, institutions that offer patient capital where you could get a loan at a very cheap um, a rate, interest rate, and also a longer loan tenure. There's also equity that's available, you know, in the form of private equity for those businesses that have a, a, a potential of scaling up uh, and become much bigger. There are private equity firms that could uh, inject capital in the form of equity and walk the journey with you. But you go to, you've got to be able to let go of some of the, the shareholding that you, you hold. And I often say to entrepreneurs, would you rather have 100% of zero mm. or would you rather have, uh, you know, 50% of something? So assessing where you are in your growth path as an entrepreneur will then help you determine whether you must go to commercial banks like Greenrod Bank or you must go to development finance institutions, uh, the likes of CFIRS, IDC and others, or must you go to corporates that are offering enterprise and supplier development finance where they can give you grant funding and or patient capital, and they can also give you access to markets through their procurement spend. So there's a number of things available there. I often say that entrepreneurs must take the time to understand what their need is based on where they are, but they must also take time to understand the mandate of each and every financial institution out there so that they don't waste time looking for finance at the wrong places. Phew, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that comprehensive answer. And I like the fact that you didn't just list them, but you also put some of the considerations that, that have to go with it because we just think when, when we hear funding, you know, when I apply everywhere without actually taking the various considerations and no wonder SMEs get to a place where they're like, ah, we've tried, there's no funding. That's probably because they don't take that, that time, as you said, to actually assess where they are 
to understand the mandates of the financial institutions that they are, that they are approaching to see if they can even you know be considered you know um, based on that financial institution. So I think that's powerful. I think it's a powerful start, as you say, before they even think about getting funding. To start off by saying, you know, where are we in our growth cycle, and which are the organizations out there that are willing to work with 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 someone, you know, in in our position. But you know, before maybe we get into some of some of the ways they can they can you know go about accessing those institutions, maybe we can take a step back and start talking about the fact that yes, you know, a lot of small businesses struggle to to access funding, and and I believe you know about that, but you also know the other side of people who have gotten funding. So I feel like you're the best person to assess this. And, you know, the next question then would be, what are some of the things that are the causes or, you know, the, the reasons why SMEs end up not getting funding? You, you know, before I answer the, the question about why SMEs uh, end up not getting funding, I think it's important to also know that most people would uh, stop doing what they need to do in their businesses because they think they need funding. So that assessment of where you are in your growth phase and who can help you and who can't help you. The third thing I want to add is to assess whether you actually need funding or you can actually bootstrap your way and then get funding at the right level when once you've sorted out a number of things. Because sometimes uh, people would stop uh, you know, pursuing their entrepreneurial dreams because they cite access to funding as a as a barrier of entry. I think that it's important to assess whether you actually need funding now or you need funding later or you need funding at all. So what are some of the things that um, have uh, that uh, make entrepreneurs not get funding? I think that the biggest one is what I've highlighted earlier to say, if you go to the wrong institution looking for what you're looking for and their mandate is not what you're looking for obviously they're going to decline you so it's important to understand whether um you you uh, you would be qualified to go to a commercial bank or you would be qualified to go to a grant funder or you would be qualified to go to a corporate that is also going to offer you access to market so that you uh, minimize uh, wasting time you go straight to the funders that are likely to listen to you and you don't waste your own time. The second thing is um, researching what those funders are looking for. So it's one thing to know that, okay, for my financial needs, I need to go to a commercial bank or I need to go to a development finance institution. But once you get there, if you have done your research well enough, good, uh, well enough you can then understand that uh, this commercial bank is requiring A, B, and C for them to process my uh, my application. Some uh, uh, funders are looking for a business plan. So why waste time, go and knock and not research and say, what are the business requirements uh, for my funding? So one of the biggest things that is required for funding is to have a business plan or some form of a, a business proposal with financial projections to determine Exactly. If you were given these millions of friends, how would you use them? The other thing I want to highlight, the third one is the skin in the game. So if you are borrowing money from someone, how do you expect them to give you their money if you are not willing to put your last cent on this business venture? Mm. So having skin in the game is showing the funder that you believe so much in this idea that you are willing to bet your last cent and put it in here because you've researched the business idea you've done what you needed to do to make sure that even though there is risk you will mitigate that risk this way and you're willing to put your last cent uh, to it and then uh, lastly i think and this is this point about uh wanting to be jack of all trades it's something that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, suffer from particular particularly early stages of entrepreneurship where because someone has come with an idea, it's their idea alone. Ndogozo dreamt this thing. He's always wanted to start this business. It's Ndogozo's idea. Ndogozo doesn't appreciate that no one man is an island. You know, can't, you can't know everything. You can't be jack of all trades, you know. 
once you start understanding that maybe in my case i am i've got a financial background i might have a business idea where it requires someone who has a technical understanding of how to run a factory so am i just gonna you know hog my idea because i don't want to part ways with a 10 percent to give to a production manager who's quite wow. integral in that manufacturing process or am I going to be willing to, to let go of that? So those are some of the things that one needs to consider. We call it key man risk. Funders look at this and think to themselves, if we give you millions, are you going to be able to uh, manage these millions? Do you have a financial background? Do you have a team around you who can plug in on the gaps that you have in terms of skills? So if you are not willing to part ways with some of uh, uh, the shareholding or if you are not willing to employ people that bring those strengths, that those are some of the things that uh, can work against you when you're looking for funding. Phew, wow. <laughs> I really, I feel as though, you know, when somebody is, is caught, I feel as though a lot of entrepreneurs, if they're, if they're honest, they'd be caught right now to say, actually, we are guilty of these things. A lot of us are guilty of these things. You know, and if, if we were to ask that question, why aren't we getting funding? And you you would give us this list. I think a lot of us, if we're honest, would say, Ish, yeah, I'm actually guilty of a few of these things. And, and I think that's why it's, it's so awesome to know what to do as well as what not to do, because at least then you have a comprehensive on you know a way forward. But those are so those are those points are so so powerful and, and so important. And it's things can that, I add another one? Sorry, oh, yes, to definitely. Another one is, uh, so, so you apply for funding and the assessment that is done by the funder itself uh, recognizes that the business cannot handle the debt. So we always talk about cash is king, you know, in a joking way, but cash is king when you are looking for funding. So in those financial projections, uh, most funders would be looking at the cash generating capability of that particular business so that you are able to determine whether if you were given this debt, uh, we call it debt service cover ratio. If you are given this debt, will your business generate enough cash for you to repay the loan, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't have collateral, you don't have skin in the game to put on, on the table, those are some of the things that uh, funders are looking for. But more so, your business might be actually a good idea does it generate cash enough cash to be able to repay uh, the debt that you've taken it's one thing to be passionate about an idea it's another for it to be profit making so one thing i would like to uh, emphasize with entrepreneurs is to look at the business that you are doing are you uh, in the business of generating profits and generating cash or it's just an idea that you are passionate about it doesn't necessarily generate uh, profits that are required for you to cover uh, the mm. obligations that the business has sure wow that that is really eye-opening um I, I have to be honest with that and it reminds me of one of the things uh, that you you once spoke about in, in another interview where you know you, you cited this thing where entrepreneurs go to a consultant to have their business plans drawn and they have no idea what's in that business plan. And if you ask them to give you a one minute pitch on the business, they don't, they can't do that. And let alone their financials, you know, so if they don't understand the financials of their business, how can they even, you know, expect a funder to, 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 to commit to that? So I think that that is something that a lot of small business owners need to need to look at. And would, would you then advise them to, to learn how to write business plans or to be part of the process with a consultant while the business plan is being drawn up? Look, Ndogozo, not so we, we are all qualified in different things and we all have different skills. I cannot say one must know ins and out of how to actually put the business plan together. But I'm sure you will agree with me that if you are a business owner, you need to know your business from A to Z, right? And it can be right that an, a consultant writes your business plan from A to Z and you have no involvement whatsoever in there. So let's say here is a business owner. They don't have the ability to actually do financial projections, but they have an idea. They can put it on paper and say, this is the, this is the business I want to get into. 
This is the customer I want to sell to. This is the price I'm thinking of charging. My business is going to be located uh, in this area. I'm going to serve the whole of South Africa or just uh, Gauteng province. And I'm going to employ so-and-so to do this and this. If I'm manufacturing a, a bottle of water, someone is going to do this in the process. You can articulate that because you, you are the one who came with the idea, right? But what I'm highlighting about the business plan uh, is that our strengths are different, right? So the business plan, you can write it uh, at a high level, but you can then get an accountant to put the very same qualitative things that you've put on paper into a number format, financial projections on the business plan so that they can speak the language of a funder mm. and they can ask you questions. So if you wanted to uh, price this product at this level the cost of the product is how much and then they explain to you that you can't sell a product at five rand if you have produced it at a cost of 10 rands you're already making a loss you can't mm. disregard that beyond the production cost itself there's rent to be paid there's furniture there's this there's that Variable, variable and fixed costs that you need to take into account as your overheads. So what I'm emphasizing is that as a business owner, if you don't have a certain skill uh, such as a financial analysis, which is very important because funders are looking at your financial records, they're looking at your business holistically, you must then get someone who can help you with those but be a, a, an integral part, play an integral part in coming up with that business proposal. Because in these days of uh, COVID-19, most funders now have started calling entrepreneurs to come and do an elevator pitch and tell the funders mm. why should you be given these millions. Imagine now if the consultant has written the business plan for you and you are called and they say they like your business idea, they've read, they understand what it is, but they just want to hear from the entrepreneur talk also as, as to why we should give them funding. And then you go blank. There goes mm. your opportunity to get funding. Mm. So know something, if not most of the things about your business. Phew, wow. Thank you so, so much for that. I think we needed to hear that. Um, we all need to hear that because there's it's one of the things that is, is yeah, you know, there's, there's not much clarity on when it comes to business plans and, you know, the, 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 because, the, you know, I also help some people out with business plans because I do have an accounting background, but sometimes I get frustrated because they come through and they expect me not to just do the business plan, but to formulate the whole business model. And I'm like, but then even if I do that, what, you know, how are you going to continue with that business? So it does make sense why this could be one of the barriers to getting financing. And I'm, I'm hoping that the, you know, everyone who's watching is learning about how to avoid these pitfalls and how to go go on ahead, you know, with the next level in, in, when you when you want funding. And and I think just just you, you touched on COVID-19 there. And one of the things that, that we noticed uh, during COVID-19 is, is that um, when, for example, the Department of Small Business Development was releasing the COVID funding, um, I, I was reading a report on it and they spoke about how most of the entrepreneurs there who were applying did not even have the basic um, criteria to be considered for funding, you know, let alone the, the next stages that you need to, you know, to be considered. They didn't even have the basic fundamentals. And, and that's one of the things that I, that really saddened me when, you know, when I thought about it, like, okay, maybe people don't know what these things are. So what would you say are the basic fundamental requirements that a small business should have before even considering knocking on a door to get funding? I mean, we've spoken about the business plan, but I'm, I'm assuming maybe there could be more. Yeah. So I think it's it's also the legal structure of the, the business. You could be a sole proprietor. You could be a PTY limited. You could be, you know, a listed entity as you grow uh, in, in the business. I think the importance, though, whether you're a sole proprietor or a PTY, I think CCs are no longer there uh, or uh, being uh, uh, done now. What is important is that you formalize your business. So if you have formalized your business, you would have started with having a bank account that regulates and uh, uh, takes care of your cash flows in the business. 
and it would be separate from your personal bank account so that when the funder is saying, okay, you've been in business for this, uh, this long, can I get your bank statement so that I can assess what has been going on? You're able to produce a, a legal entity or you're able to produce a tax certificate, you're able to produce a bank statement and you're able to say my annual returns are in, in, you know, in place and are up to date and this is what I've been doing so far. If it is a startup, then you are able to say, here is my idea. I've already gone to uh, the authorities to check how do I open a new account. I've already opened a bank account. I've got all these things. So it's important to then formalize yourself so that you look professional. Uh, I'm not saying in care unnecessary costs if you don't have the money, but if a, a funder is going to send you a uh, business requirements, do you have an email address? The answer should be yes even if it's not a, an email address that's got your company name, but you could even use the free ones like Gmail and say ABCPTY Limited at Gmail and demonstrate that you are aware that you need to look professional. These are the things that you are going to be uh, doing. So formalizing your structure is, is very important so that you can submit the requirements to, to the funders as and when they're looking for. I can't emphasize the importance of financial uh, uh, recording in terms of the basic. That's the basic I want to highlight amongst everything else, because if you have your financial records in place, then the funder is able to assess what is going on with your business. Oof, wow. Thank you. Thank you for those. Um, and and it's it should be a no-brainer, uh, right? <laughs> they, they should be formal. They should have these documents. But for some reason, you know, in our country, we find a lot. Um, I remember at the Black Business Council Summit, you know, um, I think it was the CEO of um, C5, if I'm not mistaken, spoke about the fact that they've even started making an automated registration process because they found that so many of their applicants didn't have any sort of formal structures, any business um, a, a bank accounts, you know, they were not registered. And I think one of the things that businesses need to know, if you want to be serious about your business and if you want somebody else to give you their money, their hard-earned money, these are the basic requirements that you're supposed to have. You cannot complain and say, I cannot make this work. I don't have money for this, but you're asking somebody else to give you money. I feel like we should also realize, you know, at the minimum that these are the things that we should put in place in order for us to be eligible for funding, you know, in the country and, you know, be more proactive as entrepreneurs. So, you know, as you're saying, you know, those basic requirements, those are the ones that all entrepreneurs going for, you need to make sure that you have those even before you, you apply for funding as Umis Nyanga has said. And, and I just, let's just think going forward, um, you mentioned something earlier that maybe some people won't understand, maybe they never heard the word. You spoke about the importance of understanding whether or not you need funding or if you can bootstrap your business. And maybe some people don't know what bootstrapping means, you know, um, and, and of course, you know, that means, you know, using your own money to, 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 to start the business. But I wanted to ask, based on that, do you think that SMMEs in South Africa are too dependent on external funding? And if so, what is the alternative? You know, if you think stop relying on funding so much, what are the alternatives that they can do in the meantime before they get ready for funding? You know, I'm thinking immediately of two things. Um, one, our our forefathers, uh, you know, uh, had general dealers, you know, in the township, in the rural areas, there were general dealers. I don't recall, I mean, I'm not that old. I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I don't recall um, that they were lining up looking for funding left, right and center. I think mm -hmm. they made do with what they had and were able to take us to school, were able to put food on the table with the money that they uh, generated from general dealers, from informal businesses selling uh, you know, vegetables and fruit along the side of the road, other people having saloons and, you know, and uh, there's, there's a number of businesses, particularly in the African uh, 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 generations where people have managed to run businesses whether they were informal or not, but they've run businesses. So I think that we need to give ourselves credit that we're able to uh, make do, we were able to make do with what we had. 
yes, yes, uh, things have changed. Uh, and <coughs> in the in the age of uh, you know social media and online platforms, it gives it it then takes me to the second point that during uh, the the peak of COVID nineteen. We saw a number of businesses being gener being uh, established online, right? People started thriving businesses online, and that bus those businesses didn't necessarily require a, a, a huge amount of capital. So I'm citing those two examples to say, if you look back uh, at our previous generations, I think that there is a lesson to be learned there. Uh, from our forefathers, how they've done it. And secondly, people have become very innovative using social media and other platforms to uh, sort of uh, develop businesses that didn't require a lot of capital. Now, when we talk about bootstrapping, for example, it's easy to want to start a business and fake it till you make it. Things like where are your offices? You don't necessarily need to go have offices in Sentin, that is minus an overhead cost there that you don't necessarily need, right? Mm -hmm. And how many people do you start with? You don't necessarily have to put a fixed um, amount of people on your payroll. You could start with one or two and then get freelancers as and when you need them. That mm -hmm. is part of the strategies of managing your, your costs uh, down. You could also then uh, have relationships with your suppliers. Hence, I was mentioning earlier that there are opportunities with corporates that have to meet BE requirements where they give enterprise uh, development uh, opportunities to SMEs and develop them. And they also give access to markets through their, their supplier development uh, initiatives. So you could have a relationship with your uh, uh, customer where they pay you 50% or 70% deposit before you actually incur any cost. That way you are able to go and get the raw materials and produce and pay the person you are working with before then uh, you, 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 and then you get paid by your, your customer. So there are a number of things. My point is really around managing your cost down such that you don't find yourself with unnecessary overheads that mm -hmm. are not uh, being handled by the revenue that you're generating. Sure. Wow. I am so in love with that answer. I feel like it's incredible, especially the way you started it. Um, the fact that our forefathers actually had general dealerships and they didn't go to a bank or some big corporation to get funding. I can't believe I have never thought of that. That is absolutely incredible. And you think about it, even apart from general dealers, you know, down the street, there could be someone selling vegetables. Down the street, there could be somebody, a tailor who's working on shoes. There were so many of these businesses that were started without formal funding. And, you know, these are some of the, I feel like the mindset that we have to go back to sometimes as business owners and maybe even learn lessons from them concerning yeah. how did you start, you know, and, and maybe those are some of the conversations that we should be having with them. So at least we're not, we're not so dependent on external funding. And when we do go ask for funding, we're at a place where we have generated some income. The, you know, the funders do see that there is some traction. And I believe traction sometimes plays a huge role when, when, you, when you're asking for funding. Um, so I really do uh, love that answer. And I, I hope everyone who's watching, you know, can start thinking outside the box concerning ways in which you can start your business venture, you know, without needing, you know, to apply for funding. I feel like it's a similar stereotype, not stereotype, it's a, it's a similar mindset to, you know, so many people who are applying for jobs and because they're not formally employed, they're sitting doing nothing instead of using their skills to do something. I feel like it's similarly, there's so many entrepreneurs who apply for funding and don't get funding and sit down and say, I'm not funded, instead of starting with what they have. And, and I believe that's something that that definitely they should be taught. And, and maybe as a side question quickly, do you think then joining institutions like um, incubators would be a good yeah. step for them to start uh, in, in, in that journey? I think so. I think so. Ndogozo, incubators, how can I forget them? I think there's a number of them out there. Some are linked to uh, private sector. Some are linked to pi uh, public sector. Some are driving innovation. You know, uh, in the world of technology right now, apps and all these platforms and everything, 
uh, and mushrooming everywhere. There, there is support out there. The nice thing about incubation is that you are under, you know, the wing of uh, someone who's willing to invest in uh, your idea, someone who is willing to invest, even if you fail, you fail forward, which is something that we need, I think, in South Africa in terms of encouraging failure so that people can learn from failure as part of success and move forward. Because if we are not failing, you're not trying, right? So, mm. so in the world of entrepreneurship, taking risk should be encouraged, uh, failing forward should be encouraged. And incubators have that risk appetite and ability to put you under their wing and make sure that um, you sort of uh, self-correct as you go along and you learn from those mistakes. Wow, I'm glad I asked this question. Thank you so much for that. And I really hope everybody got that because I feel like it's one of the shortcuts that we can have being part of incubation systems while we're still building our, pro our products or um, minimum viable products and things along those lines. So thank you so much, ma'am, for, for that answer. And unfortunately, we have come to you know the last question uh, because of time. Um, although we've been enjoying this so, so much, um, I'm learning so much and I believe the others are learning so much as well. But just finally, you know, just wanting to get a bit into your, your banking, you know, your banking background or your banking current, <laughs> um, current, um, yeah, expertise. I've seen something where, you know, when you're looking at, I, I, maybe I'd call it a risk gap, you know, where you're looking at banks and financial institutions who, as part of their daily operations, want people to fund, right? Because lending is part of the product offering of a bank or financial institutions. And then on the other side, you find SMMEs who need this funding, but in between there's this gap that, you know, stops them from connecting and that's called risk, right? You know, SMEs are very high risk um, in nature. And that I'm sure is one of the reasons why banks and financial institutions find it very hard to fund a lot of them because of that risk that, 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 that exists. You know, so what are some of the ways you think SMMEs or some of the things SMMEs can do to reduce the risk profile when it comes to the site of financial institutions? I just think generally SMEs are SMMEs are, are, are have a high risk profile by by virtue of being in the entrepreneurship space. Um, one of the things that is important is to define the market that you are playing in. You know, be clear as to who are you selling to and be clear of the cost of uh, doing business and understanding what works for you and what doesn't work for you. But I think for me, I would twist that uh, question around and sort of have a call to action for financial institutions. Where I am at Green Road Bank, we're trying to find ways to partner with the relevant people in the entrepreneurship ecosystem uh, where you can sort of play your role uh, wherever you are, but together we have a much more meaningful impact so that we can then help address the and mitigate the risk that you are highlighting in the SME space. So for instance, if we partner with a, a government institution that offers grants and as a commercial bank, you're mitigating your risk there because there's someone who's willing to take the first loss and they're willing to put a grant funding, they're willing to put a, a patient uh, capital where it's longer uh, tenure and it's got less interest. So a combination of all these players in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, including commercial banks like us, development finance institutions and public uh, institutions that offer grant we can then be of assistance to SMEs, uh, even with that high risk. Because remember, entrepreneurship and SME is a very uh, a big contributor to the economy. It's a job creator in the economy. So if we are very much risk averse, we're never going to achieve what some of the countries like Germany have achieved uh, through supporting SMEs. Wow. <laughs> Shoo, that is so incredible. Wow, I wish, I don't know what to say. I wish I, you had a bigger platform to say what you just said <laughs> because I, that's that's mind blowing. And the fact that Grimrod Bank is working on those is absolutely magnificent, you know, that, that there should be an ecosystem, 
you know, collaboration when it comes to reducing the risk profile of SMEs so that at least, you know, all parties, you know, are, are, are helping one another to reach this goal of, you know, having a thriving equals, I mean, SME um, yes. sector in our country. We need that. And instead of saying that the SME, putting it all on the SMEs, you know, the, eco, the ecosystem participants coming together to form such an infrastructure, I think it's absolutely genius. And, and, and I wish you all the best when it comes to that initiative. And I, like I said, I wish you had an even bigger platform to say <laughs> the things that you were saying, but we will try by all means to make sure that this content is heard, you know, far and wide because it's really valuable content. And with that, we have come to the end of the show, unfortunately, and we really hope to have you again in our season two, but today was mind blowing and, you know, value, you feel like you've created so much value and changed so many lives of SMMEs as long as they, they listen to you today. I want to say thank you so much for today and also thank you for the constant job that you're doing, you know, for SMMEs and for people, both on a personal capacity and also uh, where you are employed. And before we let you go and say goodbye, maybe you could tell people where they could find you. I know you have your own website, which is amazing. Um, and maybe any parting words that you might have for our, our viewers. No, thanks. Uh, I'm very much um, happy that I, I was invited here to talk about entrepreneurship. I'm very passionate about that. I want to say to people, let us not tire from creating uh, rather than just consuming. You can follow me on uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. I am much active there on those two platforms. And of course, my website, uh, www.ziziponyanga.co.za. And I work for uh, Green Road Bank, which uh, is uh, assisting entrepreneurs with uh, fin funding in the SME space. Thank you so, so much, ma'am. Uh, it's really, really been fantastic having you. And yes, like I said, I will only have great things to say and, you know, respect and inspiration that I draw from you. I've been following you on LinkedIn for a very long time. Well, not a long time, about a year now. And you post daily, I think. And it's so encouraging and so inspirational. And I hope everyone, you do follow uh, Umiz Nyanga on LinkedIn and on her website as well. You will get some great content like what you heard here today. So with that, we want to say thank you, ma'am, and goodbye. Wow, blown away, absolutely blown away. This is a very important topic and we had one of the best speakers in the country, I believe, to talk to us about this topic. So I hope you had your notepad out or you were taking notes because this was really, really important. And of course, you know, you can come back and watch this episode over and over again because I really believe these tools and these, these valuable principles that we are being given, we're supposed to watch them over and over again and apply them in our businesses such that we get our businesses to the next level. Some people pay thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of rands to get access to such business coaching like we're offering you on this show. So I really hope you're taking advantage of it. And I really hope you tell a friend. And of course, I, I forgot to say this earlier. If you have, make sure you like this video, if you enjoyed this content and make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you can get more and more content like this. So this is the business forecast and it's all that we have for you today. Before we go, of course, I always wanna give a shout out to Vugani M Productions who are responsible for our cameras for our studios but also you know they they do offer other services that you might need in your business so make sure that you you know you hit them up and you check them out on social media as well and before i go i want to remind you that every monday at 10 past one i do go on hope alive radio and i carry on the discussion that we had here so next week of course i'll be talking about you know the the episode that we had today just breaking down the things that umiz nyang i had for us and you know making it more maybe palatable for those who who, who felt overwhelmed but make sure you do join me on hope alive radio every monday at 10 past one it's awesome it's amazing and again we do connect businesses for free. We advertise two, two or three businesses for free there on that channel. So make sure that you, you if you're interested, just hit me up, comment on, on this video, and I'll make sure that I advertise your business there. It's all that we have for you today. Sorry we couldn't take any questions. We, we yeah, we were stuck for, stuck for time today. But thank you for all those who are watching us live and those who are watching us. I'm Doza Shachuayo. It's been wonderful. Keep pushing, keep grinding, and I wish you all the success for your business.